All right, Anna, whenever you're ready, go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Um, my name is Anna Martin. I am a contracted worker at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab under the supervision of Brett Denevy and Carolyn Ernst. Next, please. I have been working on a project with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera. We're looking at permanently shadowed region analogs. Um, these analogs are equatorial craters that are imaged under indirect illumination to mimic PSR conditions. Um, so with this indirect illumination images, we are able to compare them to the direct illuminated images because they're equatorial craters. And from here, we're able to look at the different conditions that might be happening um, based off of their reflectance variations that we're seeing. This is important um, to us because it's providing an improved basis for the interpretation and understanding of LROC PSR observations. Um, this is gonna help us with future missions going to the moon. Um, we are sending up a different camera system called ShadowCam. Um, that's going to image uh, specifically PSR um, areas of the poles. So this is helping us understand what we're going to be looking at when we send that camera up. Um, and this picture is just an example of some of the ways that we're looking at these images. Um, the first two images is the analog that is shadowed and stretched. And then the next five images are that same crater under um, direct illumination, under different beta angles. And then the last image is a DTM slope that we're using. Next, please. But I wanna give you a little bit of a background about myself as well. Um, along with this project that I'm working for with LROC at APL, um, I worked at the LROC uh, Operations Center at Arizona State University for three years, where I was the control mosaic group manager where we process and compiled high precision, high accuracy control mosaics of different lunar features. Um, one of my favorite ones is the Karpinski crater um, imaged to the right, where they essentially create these seamless map sets um, that can be used for many different, many different scientific um, observations and uh, research. Uh, another thing that I worked on similar to control mosaics was photometric data sets. Um, LROC creates these photometric sets of these specific areas of interest that have hundreds of images with phase angles ranging between zero and 110 degrees. Um, and with this, we're able to look at the different photometric properties of different areas on the moon so we can figure out what's going on. Um, an example of this is the swirl anomalies that um, everyone keeps talking about. But also at APL, I am working with the small body mapping tool team. Um, so here I've been helping update documentation about the small body mapping tool. Um, I've been processing small body data sets. Um, I've been uh, creating crater profiles that um, are being used for studies, and I've been helping verify um, new releases of the tool on an annual basis. Um, so the main software that I am comfortable with is the USGS Integrated Software for Imagers and Spectrometers, also known as ISIS. Um, I have taken classes through uh, the USGS for this software, and I've used many different parameters that it has to offer for um, many of my different projects that I've used. I also know ArcGIS and QGIS. I have a, cert, um, a cartography certificate from Esri um, that has helped with creating maps and shape files for these other projects that I've been using. Um, and again, I I've been, uh, I'm familiar with the small body mapping tool, um, and I am a beginner in Python and IDL. Um, I mostly use Python with ArcGIS, and then I've been using um, IDL with uh, my small body mapping tool data sets. Um, I do lab work there as well. Um, I love lab work. I've been sorting agglutinants out of um, Apollo samples, which has been one of the coolest things I've ever done. <laughs> um, next, please. Um, so contact me um, if you are interested in knowing anything else that I talked about today um, or knowing about anything else that I might have done. Um, here's my email, my phone number. I have my different um, profiles on here if you want to look at some abstracts that I've done as well. 
Um, but really, I can just thank you for being here and um, giving me the time to present to you. Thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. All right, up next, uh, Sam. Oh, apparently I can't start my video. <laughs> Okay. There we are. Here we are. All right, whenever you're ready, Sam. Cool, thank you very much. Um, so my name's Sam Bell. Um, I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Manchester. And my background's in geology. And currently uh, my PhD project's looking at the petrology and chemistry of Apollo 15 Mary basalts. So within the um, collection, there's uh, ba the basalts can be split into two different suites based on their bulk chemistries, uh, into the olivine normative suite and the quartz normative suite. Um, so there's some debate about how we get these different chemistries, um, even though the two suites have similar eruption ages and they were both found at the same site. So one of the ideas um, uh, shown in the schematic on the, on the right hand side is that the Quartz normative basalts might have had a more complex magmatic history than the olivine normative basalt. So I'm using um, non-destructive petrological techniques on, um, on Apollo 15 Mara basalt thin sections to try and understand this relationship between the two suites and get an idea of what magmatic processes might have been going on at the Apollo 15 landing site. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so the three main methods that I've got the most experience with um, are crystal size distribution analysis, chem scan and diffusion chronometry. So crystal size distribution um, analysis looks at the population of crystals of particular lengths within a sample to try and identify different um, magmatic processes, whether that be um, multiple stages of cooling, magma mixing, um, addition or fractionation of crystals. And the idea behind this is to try and see if we see any evidence of differences between the two Apollo 15 um, suites that could hint at different magmatic histories. Um, this method plays into um, ChemScan and why we used ChemScan. Um, a bit of background, ChemScan uh, runs alongside a scan electron microscope and it produces high resolution mineral phase maps. Um, it does this by combining bat scatter brightness and EDS spectra, um, comparing data to a predefined mineral database and producing a mineral map. So I've spent quite a lot of time um, creating a mineral uh, database that's tweaked specifically to uh, lunar and polar compositions. And the idea of behind using ChemScan is to investigate whether we could use ChemScan as a semi-automated um, method of crystal size distribution analysis. Uh, so Crystal size distribution requires a lot of manual tracing around crystal boundaries, um, whereas ChemScan has the ability within its processes to separate different minerals and uh, separate individual crystals of the, that particular mineral. And then uh, I've also been doing some diffusion um, modeling. So diffusion is a time dependent process. Um, so if you have a zone crystal within your sample, you can investigate the chemical profile using um, electron microprobe and then model this profile in terms of um, diffusion timescales. So it gives you an idea of how long that crystal has resided in a particular magmatic system. So in terms of Apollo 15 samples, we're looking at it to see um, the timescales of uh, iron and magnesium diffusion in olivine crystals to see whether we can see any difference between the two, um, two different suites. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so this is just an idea of, of where we're up to at the minute um, in terms of crystal size distribution analysis. We've done it on several samples and we've still got a few more samples to go to really get a full picture of um, with the sample set that we've got available. Um, but generally, um, we found that uh, suites are showing similar concave upward trends. Um, in terms of ChemScan, um, over the weekend, our paper went up on general petrology, which was very nice timing. Um, so the details are there in the uh, center of the screen. But um, we found that, um, and one of our main findings was that ChemScan um, really depends on the texture of the sample, um, the reliability of the crystal size distribution that it produces. Um, but it was a really good chance to explore some of the methods um, behind this process. 
And then finally, um, the diffusion modelling, we were hoping to present that at LPSC this year. So if you want to find out more about that, um, refer to our abstract. Um, but as a general overview, we're getting timescales of, of less than six years um, across both suites, um, and they're both falling within similar ranges of each other. So we're currently working on um, improving this fit um, by looking at um, modelling uh, temperature dependence, um, as well as incorporating um, elements of growth. Um, so hopefully I've given you a quick overview of, of some of my experience, um, of some of my background, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Um, open to any questions anybody might have. All right, thank you, Sam. Um, moving next, I'm not sure Veronica was able to join us this morning. So that being the case, <clears throat> we're gonna go on to uh, Ankita. Hello, good morning. Okay, well, uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, hello, uh, my name is Ankita Vashish and uh, my background is in electrical engineering and right now I'm doing my master's in remote sensing and GIS from Indian Institute of Remote Sensing. Uh, right now I'm uh, working in uh, radar planetary science and uh, on um, the data set of uh, LRO, Mini, RF and Chandray. Chandrayaan data set and uh, um, in my project, uh, uh, can, I, uh, can I have the next slide please? Uh, in my uh, project, uh, my main objective uh, is to do uh, machine learning uh, uh, modeling to predict the dielectric constant values of lunar regolith. And uh, in this, I've made a, a machine learning model based on artificial neural network. Uh, and uh, I have uh, basically in this uh, model, I have uh, uh, done a simulation of uh, data set by integral equation method. And then I have uh, prepared a neural network architecture to uh, retrieve the uh, real part of dielectric constant values of Apollo 17 landing site. And uh, further, I am going to um, apply this model on uh, lunar polar craters so as to uh, see that um, uh, what is the uh, probability of finding uh, water ice uh, which is which has been a great like uh, upcoming uh, ongoing research uh, uh, in uh, lunar exploration and uh, uh, basically like uh, uh, based on uh, surface roughness i have made uh, two models uh, of uh, um, Gaussian model and uh, exponential uh, distribution model and uh, um, uh, the, uh, my I'm going to submit my thesis on this uh, project topic uh, that is polarimetric modeling for scattering based dielectric characterization of lunar surface in uh, June month. Um, this is uh, actually I have not included my results right now because uh, my thesis is ongoing and uh, I'm going to submit this shortly. So after that only I can um, like give the or submit the results. That's why. And can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is my contact details. Uh, if uh, some other details you want. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ankita. Uh, up next we have Mike. Oh, there he is. Yep. Hello. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I am Mike Torsivia. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of my education background. So my undergraduate degree, I received a bachelor's in science of, in geology from the University of Georgia. There I did a senior thesis, which is titled the Locating Crystalline Arsenic Phases in Cortez Hills Rock Samples Using X-ray Diffraction Analysis. And my advisor there was uh, Dr. Doug Crow. Currently, I am a fourth year PhD candidate uh, trying to get my PhD in earth sciences from the University of Notre Dame. So my uh, dissertation working title is Unraveling the Components in Lunar Highlands Materials. And there I am working with uh, Dr. Clive Neal. My expected graduation date should be sometime around this fall, 2020. On the right, I have included a couple of uh, pictures uh, that I took of my different samples that I took for each different project. So on the top are some of the whole rack samples from Cortez Hills Mines that I actually uh, took myself. 
And on the bottom, I did not take that picture because uh, I think, believe that was taken in the 70s. Uh, that is Apollo 16 sample 6025, which is one of the primary samples that I study. Uh, also, I, I didn't include this uh, written down here, but I also have worked with Dr. Bob Craddock at the uh, Air and Space Museum. And there I uh, did some work with him one summer uh, as a field assistant for Mars analog studies. Uh, could you advance the slide, please? So a little bit of my research experience, as I mentioned before, my past research was uh, primarily with PXRD analysis on crushed whole rock samples to identify different arsenic phases. However, recently I've also been able to do crystal size distributions or class size distributions on lunar basalts and a couple of Verona orthocytes as well. This is a quantitative petrographic analysis technique that uh, I've used to determine whether or not certain samples or lunar basalts are endogenous or impact belts. However, the primary focus of my current research is characterizing a suite of lunar Verona and orthocyte samples using a variety of different in situ techniques. These include uh, petrography, so you know, getting down to the basics of the microscope, electron microprobe analysis, X-ray fluorescence, and laser ablation ICPMS, so a mixture of uh, non-destructive and destructive techniques. Uh, I also have some experience with laser ablation multi-collector ICPMS uh, for isotopic analysis in terrestrial appetite, and I did that with uh, Dr. Tony Simonetti, and that was uh, just a little directed study I did on the side. On the right, we have a few figures. On the top is a rare earth element plot of average plagioclase composition that I've taken from different thin sections of 6025. And on the bottom left is an example of a uh, photomicrograph that I took of one of the thin sections that is 6025273. -273. And on the right is a false color image of a pyroxene grain uh, that was actually taken using uh, X-ray mapping. Uh, and so, could you advance the slide, please? So my research interests as of right now, and, and also my contact information, I'm primarily interested in lunar and other extraterrestrial material and applying different in-situ analysis techniques to better characterize those samples. Um, in the future, I'm looking at possibly taking my project that I'm currently focused on and moving into other areas of the moon, specifically the MG suite and the material that we have there, as well as I'd also like to expand and characterize and identify other material in lunar meteorites and the different class that you see in those. And a little bit kind of a, not something I'm necessarily an expert in, but I'm interested in as well as investigations into Vesta and HUD meteorites. Another thing that's more uh, Earth side would be terrestrial analogs for lunar igneous processes, looking at layered mafic intrusions and anorthosite formation within those. And at the bottom is my contact information, as well as a picture of me, so you can see what I look like when I have access to a barber. Okay. And uh, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Mike. And just as a reminder to uh, folks watching online, um, when we finish with our presentations here, after our next two presenters, uh, you'll have a chance to uh, speak with any one of our presenters in a separate uh, breakout room. And if you want to do that, just send a chat, message to the chat uh, box with the name of the presenter and we will get you, uh, get you two paired up in a room. Okay, so up next is Dave. Hi everybody. Um, so my name is Dave Burney and I'm currently at the very end of my PhD um, at the University of Notre Dame. And I'm going to go through kind of uh, the, the skills that I've learned throughout my graduate school career. So I started uh, doing a master's at the University of Iowa with uh, Dr. David Peet, and that actually involved a project in Iceland. And I was able to go there, which in the very middle top there is a picture of me, super awesome, in the field. And I was able to collect my own samples, and then I processed those samples myself. So I was able to make the powders, make thin sections, as well as uh, larger polished slabs to do uh, crystal size distributions, which um, Sam and Mike have talked about a little bit earlier. So I did those textural analyses. Then with the samples, um, I actually took a course specifically on um, SEM, electron microbeam analyses kind of subjects. So I used SEM to kind of do um, relative mineral compositions and map out where I would go for electron microprobe analyses. So 
on the right hand side, you can see some of those data. And what I did is I focused on the clinopyrexenes and I did a geothermal barometry on those to determine the actual depths that they were crystallizing. And so for this one basaltic deposit, we determined that most of the crystallization was happening at the base of the crust just prior to eruption. Um, I also used laser ablation ICPMS to go in and look at the rare earth element composition of those pyroxenes to see how they correlated with the whole rock compositions since we were seeing some uh, disequilibrium textures within the thin sections. So we wanted to make sure they were uh, part of the same family, if you will, uh, prior to eruption. So that publication um, should be coming out soon. It's been accepted in, in JVGR. Um, next slide, please. So I was very interested in basalts and kind of their chemistry. And I moved on to the University of Notre Dame where I started working with Clive Neal. And from there, I pivoted more towards working with ICPMS. And one of the primary issues I had to deal with with uh, ICPMS is the fact that we're, we're sorting elements by mass. And sometimes you can get multiple elements combining to create the same mass of an element that you're interested in. So on the left, you can see if you take a molybdenum plus an oxygen, you can create the same mass as a cadmium. And what I developed was a method that was published in Jazz to monitor the interfering elements. And essentially what you do is for every analysis, you monitor then sub subsequently remove them from the analysis to kind of correct the elements of interest. I then used that method to analyze a suite of uh, moderately volatile elements. And so these are a suite of elements that are a little bit more robust than things like water and sulfur and chlorine that you see on the moon. Um, but they would kind of stick around through the, the evolution and differentiation of the moon. So what we can do is essentially trace maybe what the volatiles are doing throughout that process. And what we found was that in some of the later stage materials, such as the high titanium basalt source regions, they actually suffered a degassing event. And so that publication is currently under review in GCA. Haven't heard back from them, hopefully soon. Um, but we can go to the next slide. The other prong of my PhD um, under Clive Neal uh, involves that same issue where you have multiple elements creating the same mass of an element of interest. But the other way to deal with it is you can remove those interfering elements. So the first project I monitored, the second one I remove. And what I do is I use um, wet column chemistry. So I use cation exchange columns. And on the right, you can see essentially um, positive ions will bind to this resin and the their negative ions are allowed to flow through it. And basically by adjusting recipes of acids and concentrations and volumes, you can isolate specific elements that you're interested in. And for this project, I'm looking at the platinum group elements within the Chicxulub impact basin. And so, so what I did is, um, these are very low abundance. And so what I had to do is remove all of the matrix, all of the things that could possibly interfere on them, and then run them on ICPMS. And that greatly increased the sensitivity. And what I've found is basically how the platinum group elements, which were delivered by the impactor to Chicxulub, were distributed through impact lithologies um, within that region. The, this is actually going to be multiple publications um, the plot that you see on the left is from one that is in prep currently, and then there's a second one that is also in prep, basically. <laughs> but um, in the lower right is my contact information. Again, my name is David Burney. I'm with the University of Notre Dame. You can see my email. And my broad research interests are planetary geology, igneous petrology, geochemistry, but I love learning about volatiles and doing the, the textural analyses such as CSDs. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And uh, 
for our final presentation this morning, Hannah. Hi there. Um, Kiara, sweetheart. Hi. Uh, hi, my name is Hannah O'Brien. Uh, I am currently a research assistant at the University of Notre Dame in the Neil lab with Dave and Mike. Um, I'm also a physics and astronomy TA, um, and I help manage the Sarah L. Krismanich Observatory at Notre Dame. Um, I also uh, participated in LPI internship at Johnson Space Center and Lunar Planetary Institute with Dr. David Kring and Dr. Katie Robinson. And during my time at St. Mary's College, I did economics research on immigration and FDI and foreign direct investment and um, global trade in China. And this year I joined the Next Generation Lunar Scientists and Engineers Organizing Committee. So I'm looking forward to working with them. Um, I have a range of instrumentation experiments, um, experience, uh, especially with electron microprobes and scanning electron microscopes, um, as well as petrographic microscopy. Um, and you can see here listed just the different electron microprobes I've worked with. Um, I also have a decent amount of technical experience. I can code in particularly statistical and image analysis programs. Um, and I have a good amount of experience with um, image manipulations, just Photoshop and ImageJ, et cetera. So um, next slide, please. Here is some of the research that I'm doing. So right now at Notre Dame, um, I've actually am working on a CSD program. Um, as Sam mentioned earlier, CSDs are extremely laborious and they take a long time. So we aim to try to automate part of this process um, by creating crystal traces using this unique program. Um, as you can see in figure one right here, this is actually the GUI or the guided interface for the program that we've created. Um, this allows users to run a image of a cross-polarized um, sample a image to generate a CSD trace given the crystal phases of interest. Um, and this uses a hue saturation value and a RGB filter as well as a blur filter. Um, and we've actually stacked this pipeline with multiple filters so you can try to uh, identify multiple crystal phases at once as well as a color picking tool, which is particularly useful because, um, again, as Sam mentioned, uh, with chem scans, you can uh, identify um, with chem, chem scans, um, particular crystals, crystals of interest as well. So we can use this color picker to um, narrow the field and, and get these CSD traces a lot faster. Um, and a little bit of evidence of this project towards the bottom um, in figure two, we have profile comparisons of our automated method, which is the red, and the manual method, which is yellow. Um, they have very similar slopes, which shows that it is a reliable method. And while the red is a little bit higher, um, it's actually because the automated method provides a higher population density, which actually increases the accuracy of the CSD. So we're really excited about this program to kind of see how this can help us um, increase the amount of, or decrease the amount of time it takes to uh, do these CSDs, as well as remove some of the human error. Um, I have a decent amount of experience with lots of different samples. I've worked with lunar samples from Apollo 15, Apollo 14, and Apollo 12. And I've worked with terrestrial samples from the Boltish impact, the Chicxulub impact, the Dellen impact, and the Yoruba impact. And I'm actually using all of these samples for another project I'm working on, which is comparing lunar and terrestrial impact melts. Um, up in the top right, um, B5655 is one of the Boltish impacts that I've studied. And right below that is 135127, which is a Chicxulub sample. Um, and you can see over here in figure three, we have plotted plagioclase CSDs for both these lunar and terrestrial impacts. And the goal is to actually use this automated CSD program to create a large database of lunar and terrestrial impact melts with which to compare to see if there's any sort of um, similarities and things we can learn from these two different impact fields. Um, and then finally, my project at the LPI and Johnson Space Center with Dr. Kring and Dr. Robinson. Um, I analyze phosphate minerals in Apollo 14 samples. Um, we chose ancient samples, roughly 4.2 to 4.36 billion years old, because we were interested in better understanding water in the lunar interior. Um, so we created maps of each of these samples that I studied. Uh, you can see below in the key um, for 14.31410, um, the yellow crystals uh, in the left are phosphates and on the right it's the cyan. So we did chemical analyses of these and you can actually see in figure four um, the appetite ternary of our sample study to better understand their uh, their OH content which can say something about the water um, in the lunar interior. So that was really exciting work but particularly um, I'm really excited about the CSD program and we hope to get that published um, sometime before the fall. So uh, that's my current research and the next slide please. Um, so feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about my current research um, or any opportunities. I'm particularly interested in lunar sample analysis, impact studies, in situ research, 
resource utilization and space resources. And I've linked my research gate and LinkedIn profile here as well. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Okay, uh, so that takes us to the end of this morning's session.